Okay, um, hopefully you can all see that. Bethany, if, could you let me know if uh, everyone can see that, that uh, slide on screen? Yeah, I can see it. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, so uh, welcome to the session, uh, Beyond Recycling, Introducing the Circular Economy. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today, uh, so we're gonna talk about what the uh, circular economy is, why is it important for um, tackling climate change, uh, what you can do to support the circular economy, and then uh, some examples of the circular economy in action. Um, so why are we talking about the circular economy today? Um, so we're talking about it today because this week is London Circular Economy Week. So it's been running from Monday and it finishes tomorrow, which is uh, celebrating and promoting the circular economy. So if you haven't already, if, if you don't know about uh, London Circular Economy Week, please go to the website that's on the screen there, ceweek.london. Um, and have a look around. There's lots and lots of events tomorrow, um, lots of sessions, uh, including something on conscious consumerism, on subscription-based models for businesses and a, a different approach there, uh, diets and much, much more. And then you can also watch back some of the sessions from during the week to find out a bit more about them there. So uh, before we begin, I'd like to uh, do something where we have a look at um, bits of waste that annoy you. So if you could go to the website menti.com, you can either do this in a, a different browser um, uh, on your computer, or you can also do it on your phone. It works really easily on your phone. Go to menti.com and then enter in the code there. That's 57101711. Um, and then if you could just write down the one bit of waste that really annoys you. And I think my colleague Bethany has just put uh, the link in the chat. So you can also click on that link that can then take you through to the website. And so if you can just write down the one bit of waste that really, really annoys you, um, that'd be fantastic. And then we can see what's coming up. I'm gonna switch over my screen in a moment and we can have a look at it. Um, so uh, yeah. Um, and the one bit of waste that really annoys me is the film on top of containers. Um, so if you buy, say, some strawberries, uh, they're in season now, so you can buy strawberries uh, without any sort of guilt of them flying in. Um, so that, that bit of film that's on top that protects the strawberries, that that can't be recycled. That the container they come in normally can, but that bit of film can't. And that is one of the things that just really, really annoys me. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's my one. Um, so what I'm going to do is now... Share my screen again, just a moment. And I'm going to get up the menti. So, aha, so we can see stuff coming up here. Okay, uh, there's lots of stuff coming in. So there's lots of lots of stuff around plastic. Lots of plastic coming up. So your plastic milk bottles, uh, not recyclable plastics, plastic drink bottles, uh, one use plastic, fast food packaging, sanitary products. Yep, COVID masks, yes. Uh, face masks, that's coming up as another one as well. Um, yeah, um, keep adding them in. That's really, really good. And what we can do is I can um, get a, 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 a screenshot of this once we finish. I'll, I'll get a, download a PDF and I can share this with you after, after the meeting um, so that we can all see sort of like things that, that we, we find very annoying and, and the bits of waste. And so one of the things that uh, the circular economy is trying to do is trying to avoid waste. That's one of the key things about circular economy is trying to design out waste, which I'll talk about a, a little bit more in a moment. But that's, that's one of the things that, that is, is absolutely trying to do. Um, so yeah, fantastic stuff. Right, yeah, lots, lots and lots of stuff around plastic. And then we've got masks, uh, single use coffee cups, uh, packaging, things like that. So that's really helpful. Uh, so I'll just stop sharing a moment and then I will go back into um, the presentation. Okay. I'm just going to share my screen again. Let 
we just need to run through this so we get back to where we were. So we've had a look at some of the uh, issues of waste and now we can find out about uh, the linear economy. So our linear economy is the economy that we currently um, exist in. So since the Industrial Revolution, we've been living in a linear economy where we take the resources out of the ground, we make them into what we need, and then we dispose of them. And this is often described as a take-make-waste system. Um, and basically, this shift to a high-consuming linear economy seems to have accelerated in the last 70 or so years. Um, so even in relatively recent history, we repaired and reused materials a lot more than we do now. And it really is sort of post-war post Second World War that the shift to treating products as disposable has accelerated. And the linear economy generates huge amounts of waste. Uh, and we need to deal with that as a society all the time. And as we'll find out soon, um, it's also driving climate change. So what is the circular economy? So this diagram kind of illustrates the differences between the linear economy, the recycling economy, and the circular economy. So the circular economy offers an alternative to this linear approach. So the linear approach take stuff and basically use it, go straight in the bin. A recycling economy is the next step towards a circular economy, which we could, some would argue we're, we're getting towards a recycling economy, which is where products are made and then we reuse them a few times and then they go in the bin. But a circular economy is about creating minimal waste, it's barely any waste. So you take resources out and then you reuse them, reuse them, reuse them, reuse them, remake them, over and over again so actually nothing gets thrown away and you don't actually need to take more resources out you use the stuff that's already there in the system so it keeps products parts materials at highest use value and uh offers value at all times so it's about thinking differently about how you use things so um an explanation around what the circular economy is. This comes from uh, Re London, and they are a um, they're the ones who are actually running Circular Economy Week uh, London uh, this week, and they are um, a partnership between lo uh, local authorities in London and the Mayor of London. And they their mission is around the circular economy, promoting the circular economy, um, trying to show how waste can be used in different ways and minimising waste that's generated. So they talk about designing products for multiple uses for repair and maintenance and easy disassembly. So it's about designing things in the right way. And then manufacturing products from non-toxic, renewable, recycled, and recyclable materials, um, or using um, things that design waste out. And circular economy is also about finding more efficient ways to recover materials as well. So how can, when you've manufactured something for the first time, then how can you then use them for a second, third, fourth time before they're then disassembled or broken down into the con constituent material parts and then used again. And it's about creating viable business models. So leasing and renting instead of owning. Um, so that businesses take control of the maintenance, reuse and repair uh, of the product. So it's not on the consumer to dispose of the product, it's on the business um, who's producing it to actually take control and maintain that product and maintain and use that material again. And it's also about creating new ways to help people share products and space and minimize wasted resources. So a good example of this would be, um, say, car shares and using car share instead of a private vehicle that you own. So um, research has shown that um, for a car's life, 92% of the car's life is empty and motionless. And that's not a very good use of resources. Think about all the metal and plastic materials that are taken up by a car that sits on a street or on your drive, taking up space and not being used. Um, so that's an example of, of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, talking about the circular economy and what it is. So there's a really influential organization called the Alan MacArthur Foundation. Um, and this is one of the ways, uh, one of the organizations that's leading the way on circular economy. And the name Ellen MacArthur may be familiar to you. Uh, she's a very well-known uh, uh, sailor. And she was one of the, um, I think she held, oh yeah, she held the record for um, the fastest solo journey around the world uh, in, a, in a yacht um, and um, very, very inspirational figure. And um, after she'd achieved that, one of the things she said that she noticed how much waste there was in the oceans that she was sailing through. And it really moved her. And one of the things she wanted to do was to try to make an impact on that. And one of the things she did was then she looked into the circular economy. She, it, she, um, 
thought actually this is something that I could work on so she founded the Alan MacArthur Foundation which works to bring together businesses innovators cities and lots and lots of people together on um, circular economy and how to build it um, and if you want to find out more about the circular economy and get get more information on this this is absolutely the best place to to start the Alan MacArthur Foundation they've got loads of videos that explains it really easily um, I kind of probably could have done this presentation by just using Ellen MacArthur Foundation videos. Um, but they, what they've also done is they've developed three key principles underpinning the circular economy. So this is related to the stuff that uh, we London are doing. So one is designing out waste and pollution. So waste and pollution largely comes from the way we design things. So the environment in impacts of products are there determined in the design stage. So if we design it out, we can tackle the problem at source. And I think the important thing, one of the things that stood out to me when I've been learning about circular economy and talking to people about it, is that waste is not some bug that's in the linear system where it's like, oh, by accident, this has happened. Waste is built in as an inherent feature of the linear economy. So it, it, the way the economy is set up, the way it works in the linear economy is that there is waste generators and the circular economy aims to design that out to make sure that that isn't there. Another one is around keeping products and materials in use as, as I've kind of mentioned so it's about reusing them, repairing them, remanufacturing them and um, products like food and packaging can't last so they need to be brought back into use in other ways so for example through um, composting so making that food obviously is compostable but packaging as well compostable materials where if you've used them then they can be easily turned into something else. And also about regenerating natural systems. So the natural environment doesn't create waste. Everything is food for something else. And that's a key concept that runs with the circular economy, which is that waste is food. It's just waste isn't waste, it's, it's a material, it's a useful thing that's just in the wrong place at that time. And so we, we want to get rid of it, but actually that can be used elsewhere if we think about it in a slightly different way. So we can restore and even help regenerate our natural systems through the circular economy. Uh, and why do we need a circular economy? Why is this so important? So 45% of global CO2 emissions come from the manufacture, consumption and disposal of, um, la uh, of products and materials. Um, so the rest comes from energy generation, so from generating the electricity we need, um, the heating we need, the energy we need to transport ourselves around, to transport things around. But the rest of it comes from the manufacture and consumption of stuff. Um, and so we can't get to net zero and get to where we need to be in terms of combating climate change without dealing with these carbon emissions. Um, and the circular economy kind of breaks the link between emissions and the stuff that we buy and consume. Um, it's founded on, um, on renewable energy as the power source behind it, and it's about minimizing impact on the environment and minimizing carbon emissions that are tied into it. So shifting to a low carbon circular economy um, helps us deal with those consumption-based emissions, which is what they're, they're known as. So why else do we need a circular economy? So another thing is that the circular economy offers a great chance for businesses. It's a business opportunity. So there's um, increased resource efficiencies that come from a circular approach because you're designing things in a different way and reducing the wastage of materials. Um, you're decreasing the volatility, price and supply. So quite often in the linear economy, there's um, peaks and troughs and, and it's difficult to get the materials to where you need them to be. If they are in constant circulation in your economy, then actually you can probably access a lot of materials you need locally within either your country or the region that you're in. Um, and, and that actually helps with the supplies that you need. And then also regulatory trends are shifting towards circular approaches. So, for example, the environment bill that's um, going to go through Parliament this year, um, that is... Uh, putting a, what's called extended producer responsibility onto companies that they have to take ownership of the waste that they generate as as part of their products and so real have identified five circular economy business models so one is around making the most of stuff making things well recycling things out renting not buying and also sharing as well um, and so the alan MacArthur foundation estimates that there's um, potentially 1.8 trillion uh, euros worth of value to be found in Europe alone by adopting circular economy approaches.
and that's by 2030. So there's a huge opportunity for businesses here as well. And also it kind of grapples with the um, idea of growth with climate change. Quite often people say you can't have growth in the economy um, if you're tackling climate change. But if you've got growth in the circular economy, actually that helps combat climate change. So this is a diagram produced by the Ellen Carr Foundation, which kind of illustrates the, the whole system approach. And this is what they, they do. They talk about a whole system approach. And, and that's why it's quite important to think about it that way. And uh, so it's called a butterfly diagram. So you can see how different processes fit together uh, to prolong the life of materials and how they can be returned to the natural environment. So on the blue side, uh, you've got um, sort of stocks, so you've got items. So that would be electricals, white goods, things like that, um, where you can share them, you can maintain and prolong them through repair, you can reuse or redistribute and then ultimately recycle them. But recycling is at the outer edge of this. So this is why we call this, this session Beyond Recycling. It's about moving further than that. Recycling is sort of the last, the last ditch thing you should be trying to do with the circular economy. And actually that those other things when sharing, prolonging, um, redistributing are the things that, that we should be thinking about more prominently. And then on the green side, you've got around sort of natural materials like food and stuff like that. And there's different thick ways you can, can, you can deal with that around sort of using things again and again and digestion and then turning stuff into the biosphere as well. So that then it becomes food for growing other things. So I've kind of tried to explain to you as simply as I can a, quite a complex idea around the circular economy. So what I'm going to do now is actually show you how this works, and give you some examples about this. So uh, this is um, Gerard Street and they're a Dutch headphones company and they, uh, they make fully modular headphones where all the components can be swapped out and repaired. So you can buy the headphones and get free repairs or you can subscribe monthly and get repairs and also upgrades to your headphones. And then any broken parts are repaired or recycled. Um, so yeah, it's a different model and a different approach to it where you know, I tend to run through headphones every couple of years because I, I use them quite a lot. Well, I did before I was stuck at home for over a year. Um, but I used to, they used to get battered in my bag, they'd break, things like that, and I'd have to buy headphones. Um, and so then I would buy cheap headphones because I didn't want to buy expensive ones that get broken. And then you've got a cycle where I would be buying headphones. Whereas actually there's probably only one or two components that were broken in those and the rest of it was perfectly functional. So actually you could use this. So um, statistic around electrical waste is that 20% of electrical waste that's, thro that's thrown away functions perfectly. It doesn't need a repair, it can be used. And also 100% of electrical waste can be recycled. It, there's materials in there, there's components in there that can be taken out and used. And even if those components can't, aren't functional, they can be stripped and used. The, the metals and minerals within inside, them, inside them can be used again. So is there another example? Yes. Uh, so this is toast ale, and they use leftover bread in the making of their beer. Um, so this stops unused bread going to waste, and, and bread is one of the, the biggest sources of food waste in the country. Um, it, it's, it's a huge amount, I think it's something like 30% of all bread is thrown away um, because people buy too much, and then it goes mouldy, and then it gets thrown away. And so uh, what toasts do is they use this bread in the brewing process. It replaces some of the barley that they use in, in the brewing. And so the advantage of this is, yes, you're using this waste material, but also they don't need as much barley to go into their process. So that means they don't need to use as much land to grow barley. And they don't need to use as much water to grow the barley. And they, therefore it reduces carbon emissions. So what's your role in the circular economy? So you take part in the economy, everybody buys stuff. Some people buy more stuff than others, um, but everyone takes part in the economy. So you can help shift it. Your behavior, your, what you buy, the way you spend your money can help shift it. Um, so you can support businesses, produce some projects that are embracing the circular economy. Um, so thinking about what you buy. So what other things you're buying? Are they sustainable? Are they circular? Are, are you able to recycle them, to, to um, reuse them, to share them. Think about what you're throwing away. Is there something that actually you don't need to throw away? Think about how that can change. Can you look at 
renting, can you look at sharing instead? So a good example is, do you need to buy a drill for, to do some DIY that you're going to, like me, probably keep in your shed for the vast majority of the year and only use about four times? Actually, is there a way of sharing your tools using a tool library, perhaps, where you don't need to buy it, you can just use it when you need to? Um, also, I'd say circular-ish is fine. So don't be hard on yourself. A lot of these things don't exist yet. There's not that many options out there. And sometimes they can be expensive. Sometimes they're much cheaper and actually much better value for money. But sometimes they are more expensive. So I would say be kind to yourself around it. That It's not always possible to find the things that you need or not find the things locally. Hopefully that will change over time. But circular-ish and trying to do stuff that's almost circular, but sort of oval-shaped. Um, it is a way of doing it and also tell others about circular economy share this idea and talk about it one of the things that, that we do in our work on climate change at Richmond is we say talking about climate change is one of the most powerful things that you can do and certainly that applies to the circular economy and also and think about your work actually um, especially if you're in a, a position to influence any of this sort of stuff so how can your business or employer be more circular so let's look at another couple of examples and then we can uh, go on to listen to our speakers. So Patagonia is quite a famous firm in terms of circular economy, and they design clothing that's, that's going to be long lasting, it's well made, it's well put together, they use recycled plastic in its clothing, and they also offer repairs for its clothes and, and tips and instructions on how to repair clothes yourselves as well. And they also host a site where used Patagonia clothing can be resold or donated as well, which is, again is contributes to that circular approach and there's also a, a circular clothing example in uh, based in uh, Richmond um, so it's called Little Loops um, and so they offer um, children's clothing rental where you can buy uh, where you can rent um, wardrobe staples for children as they outgrow them so often and so this is a subscription-based service where you can rent the clothes once they outgrow them then you send them back you get some more clothes and, um, and that's a potential way of also saving money, potentially, if, if you're buying lots of clothes for your children and then sort of having to get rid of them. And lastly, in terms of the examples, this is a circular building. It doesn't look very circular, it's quite square, but it's actually a circular building. So it's built with the circular economy in mind. Um, so the whole building is modular. Um, so it can be taken apart and reused. It's made from materials that have a material passport attached to it. So that means it can be traced um, and then also uh, they actually, because they know that they can reuse and sell on the materials, they actually partly finance the building of the structure using the potential value of the materials that they are going to sell on at the end of the life of the building, which I thought was an intriguing concept that, that you're borrowing against the building's sale later on to fund the construction of it, which is really, really interesting concept. And also you can see this beautiful green wall um, uh, in Venlo um, in Holland. And uh, this has actually improved the air quality in the surrounding area, 30% um, reduction in air pollution from the traffic that's around it, which is an amazing sort of co-benefit of a really sustainable building like this. Um, so now I want to, you to hear from some real people who are actually working in the circular economy. So uh, we've got Simon Westgarth from Richmond Furniture Scheme, who's going to talk about the work they do in claiming new furniture. And we've got Kate Cheshire uh, from Reef Alada in Teddington to talk about her store and how they avoid waste. So I will stop sharing my screen and I'll hand over to Simon. Simon. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks, um, Andrew, for uh, the introduction. So. Um, I'm going to just attempt now to share my screen and hopefully we can see. Uh, now I've just uh, fl flicked up a PowerPoint. Can, can you see that, um, Andrew? Can you just give me a thumbs up or uh, just confirm? Have you got anything on the screen? Uh, not yet. Right, hang on a second then. Let's just see if I've done this correctly. So desktop share okay let's try that anything now unfortunately not no. um okay i will try to find apologies everyone it's uh 
technology is not necessarily my friend tonight. Let's see if I can do this again. Okay. Um. No. No. Oh dear. Um, I'm just going to try and get um, the presentation up that um, was shared by Jessica Simon. So just a moment. Okay. Well, while, while while you're doing that, why don't I why don't I make a start so we haven't got a a pregnant pause in the um uh, in the presentation. Yeah. So basically, what I want to cover uh, is a little bit about what the Richmond Furniture Scheme is all about. Um, and hopefully you can all hear me okay. Uh, then I'll just, um, I want to talk through um, some of the examples of things that we that we do uh, and how we try and um, help um, people within the community. And also um, really just to think about at the end what Richmond Furniture Scheme can do a little bit more uh, to do and what we're hoping to do in the future. Um, and uh, also what we can all do in terms of thinking about um, recycling and uh, reuse uh, of um, our furniture. Ah, oh, thanks, Andrew. That's wonderful. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll say next slide, please, then, because we can we can crack on. Yeah, no problem. So um, just uh, a quick uh, thought on the principal objectives. I mean, we're we're a charity, um, and we are uh, there to really help um, people find affordable furniture. But we also have two other main um, uh, uh, objectives, which is reducing waste. Um, and offering a space for, for volunteers. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that um, further on in the presentation. So if you could uh, just flick to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so we, um, at the, 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 the furniture exchange, as it was called then, was, uh, uh, ex it was established back in 1990. So this is not a new thing for Richmond. We've been doing this for a number of years, um, but uh, it's evolved as a charity and changed its name to the Richmond Furniture Scheme in in 1997 uh, and we now have um, uh, a, a charity limited by um, uh, uh, as a company and we have seven um, trustees which is which is good for a small charity of our size um, and we're thinking about the future with uh, with our current trustee mix so yes next slide please um, and just a little bit about um, the the uh, the numbers that we that we're working to. So uh, it's been a strange year with COVID, uh, but we're as you can see we're quite a, a small turnover charity. Uh, but there's a little bit of a, a a purpose in that because we're trying to keep our prices very very low so people can actually think about reuse um, and uh, and also help those people in in most need. Um, and the charity has helped over 400 households. Uh, in what we would call the in need bracket. So that's people who come to us with grants or who, or who, who are referred to us, um, uh, refer themselves to us who are people on benefits and so on. We also have um, 51 volunteers who are sort of active with the scheme who've generated over 5,000 hours of, of help and support for the charity. So we couldn't do what we do today uh, without the help and support of, uh, of many volunteers and, um, and people who are active at the scheme. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the, because we're, we're in sort of recycling, one of the things we measure ourselves on is um, uh, the, the tonnage. So if we think about it in terms of um, uh, every time a dining chair or a sofa or something like that, it, there's, there's a weight associated with that. And actually weight costs a lot of money to, to shift around. Uh, and in a typical year, we could be talking around 100 tonnes of items that are collected uh, unfortunately, we can't use all of them, so not all of it gets redistributed. Um, but um, uh, also, again, in a typical year, we could be talking 80 to 90 tons of, uh, of products that are redistributed or, or reused. So there's some really fairly significant numbers. And actually, if it wasn't for COVID, we probably would have seen a record year last year. So uh, the numbers of inquiries we've been getting for reuse and recycling have been increasing. So if you could just go into the next slide for me, please. Um, and I mentioned a little bit about um, the people that we that we support. So in our community, we have um, uh, people who are referred to us with grants, 
uh, many from the local authority, but some from local charities. And those are folks who um, really can't afford much in a, by way of furniture. So they, we help support them. They effectively get uh, uh, furniture free of charge or they can spend a little bit more with us if they, if they choose to. But we also offer discounted furniture to people who um, self-refer. So anybody who's on benefits or anybody who's, um, uh, 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 who can, uh, uh, can prove a need, we will help support um, uh, those, uh, those customers too. But it's fair to say probably the majority, well, the vast majority is uh, of people from the general public. And we do get a lot of people who um, see our services and, um, uh, and, and that's encouraging because we really want to make sure that uh, our furniture is available to, for everybody. It's not an exclusive um, uh, thing for any particular part of the community. Next slide, please. So um, next few, next couple of slides are really just a bit of a tour around our lovely little warehouse. We're based in, in Twickenham, uh, just off a place called, um, a, a little street called Fortescue Avenue. We're on a housing estate. And as you can see, we've got um, uh, a nice little jumble of, of furniture uh, from sofas to dining chairs to bedroom furniture, you name it, we've probably got it. If you do the next slide, please. Um, and oops, and we also do, um, uh, and it's a very and it's a very eclectic mix of furniture. So when uh, hopefully when we get the next um, next picture up, although I think we've got a bit of a uh, bit of bit of. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just loading. I yeah, think. it's okay. Oh, It'll come back. Uh, so um, uh, I, was, I was just going to say we get a very very eclectic eclectic mix of furniture coming in, and all of this is donated. So. Um, one thing I didn't mention at the beginning is that uh, we offer a free collection service. So that's one of the things that helps, um, especially when you've got um, some fairly heavy duty items uh, like that big sideboard in the uh, in the centre picture there, or sofas or wardrobes or whatever it happens to be. Uh, we're there to uh, try and help uh, make that pain as, uh, as, as uh, easy as possible for people. Next slide, please. Um, and um, these are some of the displays that my volunteers have done, by the way. So uh, you, you've got um, various little uh, uh, shots that we uh, that we use. But from time to time, you may see in there that there's also items of furniture that we have um, upcycled and refurbished. So if you could just go on to the next uh, slide or two, please. Uh, so here's some examples on the on the left hand side is a couple of chairs that have been uh, reupholstered. Uh, by uh, an expert uh, upholsterer uh, called Delith, who's going to be doing a bit more work with us fairly soon. Uh, but she's uh, uh, she, uh, and we're hoping to be able to coach and encourage um, uh, that skill and uh, pass that on to people who want to come and volunteer with us at the scheme. Uh, and just towards the right hand side, there's a uh, that's actually a Budlier in pro in uh, in progress. Uh, so one of my volunteers, Claire, is doing a super job on uh, redecorating um, a lovely. A little chest of drawers. Let me put the next slide, please. And these are current examples, by the way. So you'll see um, on either side of the picture, you've got a a bench. Um, now it's a shame we we can't do do a little bit more interactively, but um, the 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 clue is that this is actually uh, made out of old bed slats and uh, bed head and bed sides. Uh, the the parasol was donated by somebody. We didn't make that. Um, the chair in the middle is just again something that we've um, a bit of old uh, uh, furniture which um, otherwise might end up in, in landfill and we try and upcycle and recycle as much of these as we as we can again very much dependent on volunteers at the time yes please Andrew next slide and sometimes we get called upon uh, to go in and, and sort of help out so these um, are pictures of um, uh, a bit of a makeover we did for uh, somebody who was in a bit of, bit of distress um, and um, uh, really in quite uh, uh, impoverished circumstances. So we basically went in, built um, a bunk bed, put a couple of single beds in, stripped out an old um, rather uh, nasty old sofa, um, put in some, um, some dining furniture and so on and so forth. So the charity is there also to uh, not only uh, reuse and, and uh, recycle furniture, but also to help those people um, who really need us and uh, really make a difference in the in the community. Next, next slide, please. 
So um, just a quick uh, um, sort of overview of what we do around volunteering. So there's everything from sales and operations through to office administration. Uh, we call our um, recycling uh, carousel, which is putting in a, a new spin on old things. Uh, but that's everything from repairing to um, upcycling and refurbishment. Um, and where we can't, where we genuinely can't do something, we will do our best to recycle it. So we recover as much as we can in terms of wood, in terms of um, metal parts uh, that can go to uh, responsible recycling. Occasionally, we do have to go down to, to town meet, so we, um, uh, we will have to do that from time to time, but we try and do that as little as we possibly can. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, just a sort of a couple of um, pictures to, to, to illustrate that. So if you can just go to the next slide, please. And, um, you know, finally, there's just a, a little bit about uh, where you can find some more information about uh, Richmond Furniture Scheme. And uh, bottom left hand corner there is our is our telephone number. So if you've if you've got that sofa that um, uh, is, is about to be replaced, give us as much notice as we can, but uh, contact that um, uh, contact us on the website or drop us an email um, and uh, we will certainly be there to uh, to try and help but um, just in terms of conclusion what I was thinking about is um, you know what can Richmond Furniture Scheme do uh, more and what we're trying to do so um, we're actively uh, looking at a, a strategic plan to try and grow what we do because we think we have an opportunity within the uh, within the borough to do far more um, if we accepted every job that we do right now, I suspect we could do at least um, double what we double what we currently do uh, in terms of the uh, in terms of the size of the operation. But it'd be limited by a couple of factors, and one of those is we've got one van, so uh, that 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 uh, that will limit us a bit. There's also space, uh, and there's also the potential to have more uh, more retail or sort of more reuse space, should we call it. Uh, to be able to uh, share the, that um, uh, what we do uh, more more widely around the borough, and I'm very conscious that we're much, you know sort of Twickenham side of the of the river, um, and I'd love to have a presence uh, on the Richmond side. So that's one. Uh, so that those are a couple of things in terms of what we're looking at and how, and how we can try and address it. I think what we as a community can potentially do more of is to really think about. Um, what could we do with that, with that piece of furniture if we're thinking about that specifically or indeed what can you do with um, uh, the old uh, the old crockery that you don't use or, or things that perhaps perhaps potentially could be used by somebody or could be of interest um, somewhere else so um, we're trying to really do what we can uh, to help and support the community in terms of reuse but also uh, we're going to continue to, to strive to support those people who really need um, our service and um, uh, and really help uh, alleviate um, uh, poverty around the uh, around the borough and unfortunately COVID um, uh, you know and the whole crisis has um, thrown up a number of, uh, of issues and there will be more people I suspect um, who will be um, disadvantaged by the uh, by the current situation needing uh, to be rehoused needing support um, and that's precisely what the Richmond Furniture Scheme uh, is there to to try and do. So I think, um, Andrew, that pretty much covers everything I wanted to uh, um, uh, to cover off. But I'm more than happy uh, if, if you want to moderate this to uh, to respond to any questions. I haven't been following the chat, but if there's any any questions that people have, I think we're going to um, go to Kate from the Refill Larder in Teddington to talk about um, to talk about. Her, her store and her work. And I think then we've got uh, quite a few questions that have come through on the chat, so then we can go to, go to that. So, okay. Kate. Fantastic, thank you very much. And um, yes, please, um, you can see you're in, in your wonderful store with, with yeah. all the jars um, behind you. Tell us about, tell us I, about the, the store. So I don't actually have any slides today, but as I'm here, I'll show you around the store as I talk as an alternative to slides. Um, I started the refill ladder as um, as an idea back in sort of the beginning of 2018, um, and I was sort of inspired by um, other shops that were similar to this opening up around the country, um, particularly in the West Country, in 
in Penzance um, where I was I was sort of doing some promotion stuff there and I saw that that whole town was awarded by Surface Against Sewage um, as the first uh, plastic free um, coastal town and I was interested in what the businesses there had done to to adapt and 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 fit into the and make their you know steps forward to getting and reducing what they were um, using and I also noticed they had this old style bulk store where people were using scoop style which you know were around the country a long time ago in on most high streets and I thought actually something similar could work in Teddington and I think there was an appetite for it and I thought that that would be the sort of shop that I would like to shop at and it's really wanted to create an alternative to what was available in the supermarkets um, and and also to try and you know open eyes locally to the conversation about it whether people thought it was a good idea or not at least it was creating a conversation so originally the store was I started it um, as a kind of pop-up just for three months and I um, sublet a few shelves in a florist and actually it worked out pretty well and, and people liked it and we got a lot of support and so we kept going and then um, we stayed in the florist until November last year and they shut down um, during COVID uh, and they still have another branch in Wimbledon so they're still going but they shut their Teddington one. So I looked for another premises and, and now we have our own shop and we've expanded what we do. But essentially, what, I don't know if, every, if, if most people might not know what we do, but the refill ladder is a way to shop without um, packaging. And it's not, um, you know, we don't claim we're zero waste, but we try and give people alternatives and, and you know, um, everything people bring in their own containers, we weigh them out and we fill them up for them. And in terms of the circular economy, we're very, very careful about who our suppliers are and how we um, receive the items and the produce that we sell. So I have probably about, I mean, my main supplier for all the food, I'll just show you around the shop a bit. Um, my main supplier for all the food is just one, most of this is organic as well, which I thought was probably important to the sort of people that were interested in reducing their waste would also be interested interested in having organic produce um so one of my main suppliers is infinity um wholesale whole food providers in brighton and they're very they've been going for sort of since the 80s and they're very careful about where they source products in terms of um a sort of human element to it as well in terms of farming and fair trade um, and then I also have probably about 30 more suppliers in terms with lots of little individual craft people that make soap down in Devon um, and handmade kind of cloth things. But if you can see in the picture, I'm not going the right way. These big barrels here are laundry liquid and fabric conditioner, um, and they hold about 200 litres each of um, the products. And so I have somebody who comes in his electric van um, about once every two weeks to refill those. And so there's no waste whatsoever in terms of those products. He also does the washing up liquid and bathroom cleaner and hand soap as well. So they, if they come in 20 litre tubs, he takes them away, he refills them and he brings them back. And then I have a similar system for coffee. So we have coffee beans which are refilled and then the, the tubs you can see them out there the big black ones um are, re, are refilled and then resent back to us and then we send them back and then things like fertilizer for the garden that's the circular system that we have set with that one um we even have just started um supplying crisps as well which are plastic free crisps um there anyway um so it gives you an idea of the sorts of things that we have um but we've got a very kind of loyal local customer base that appreciate being able to shop here. And, and, you know, I hope that the reaction that we've had, and we've seen so many more of these stores opening up all over the country. And there's, you know, they're constantly, I'm on a Facebook group with other shop owners and there's, you know, there's over a thousand people on there now and people talking about opening and I was just talking to a friend that's moving to Scotland to a kind of small village somewhere next week and they said there's two refill shops within about five miles of where they're moving so that it you know it, it has um it has grown very much since we started two years ago and I think 
supermarkets have been trialing refill and I think COVID has slowed that process down for them because it's become less of a priority perhaps. Um, and for me, you know, as a small business, I would be equally happy if the supermarkets were able to do more refill because I, I feel like it will become more regular and more every day and, and, and more people will get involved. And, and that's what we want is the reduction of waste. And that's the purpose of it really. Um, and we have customers that come in and they've brought in the same, you know, old cereal box bag that they've been using to refill from our shop for, you know, the last two years. And they're really happy about that. And, um, you know, we get through laundry liquid, which normally people buy in big plastic containers, which are about 1.5 litres. We get through, um, you know, over a, probably 200 litres a week with the two different types that we use. So we're making a difference in terms of the waste that's created and, and moving away from relying on, on recycling and getting people to understand that there is, there's another step beyond recycling that we all need to take in. And that is just reducing all the waste that we produce. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, I've got more that I could cover. I mean, I think that's probably for now, all that I wanted to say. Um, if there's any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kate. And this, so for, for Kate and Simon, there's a lot of nice comments coming through about saying how, how encouraging and really good it is to, to, to see this. Um, there's a question from Rose to um, about where in Teddington you are actually and, and the location of the shop. Oh, right. Um, we are on the high street. So we're um, opposite the old Lloyd's Bank, which is now a, a dance studio um, and next door to um, Cafe Benedict's, which used to be Carliccio's. So yeah, middle of middle of the high street. Um, yeah. And which is a good place to be. And um, we've, you know, since we've moved here and we actually have a window rather than being hid hidden behind plants, um, a lot more people have discovered us. And I saw in the comments actually someone saying there's a new shop in Richmond. I think there's a new um, refill shop that's opened in Barnes. There's refill in Sheen now um, in Culver and Nelson. They do, they're mainly a deli, but they've got a section for refill. And there's another um, health food shop on Sheen Lane that does sort of laundry leaf refill. I think in Surbiton, which is obviously out in the borough, potentially there's one opening. So, you know, I think there is an appetite for it. Um, oh yeah, and Strawberry Fill Station, which I think they do deliveries, home deliveries, and then they collect. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's picking up in terms of people understanding it. And what I like to see now is it's not just the people that are very dedicated and very sort of focused and, and taken in about why it's becoming more mainstream. And that's the, the importance. And that's what we wanted to make it accessible. And we wanted to make it target at families and um, you know just people that want to do their bit and, and give them access to being able to make a change in their daily lives. Fantastic, thank you very much, Kate. Um, so uh, there's some questions that come through on the chat. Uh, one is around uh, from Jill, Jill Simeon, uh, who's asking about uh, Richmond rubbish pickup and refuse um, and recycling old bits. And so, um, yeah, I, I can answer that because um, yeah, it's, we have some bulky waste collection are recycled, but some can't be. So um, uh, apparently sort of toasters, kettles, desk pans, they can be recycled, but some, some we don't, uh, don't recycle. Uh, but we are looking at actually increasing the amount that we can recycle. We're looking into that at the moment. Um, but Jill, you asked about ovens, and, and I'm afraid I don't have an answer around that about what about whether we, we do ovens. So, um, but thank you very much for the question. And it is something that we are looking at. And there's also the uh, Richmond Freegal, um, which you can sort of advertise stuff um, and you can exchange items for free of charge. So that might be an option for people to use if you need to get rid of things. Um, also, there's, there's a few uh, questions um, that come in around the library of things. I'm just gonna pick somebody, um, Mon, um, you wanted to ask, ask about library of things. If you can just take yourself off mute and uh, you should be able to, to ask, ask a question. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I think somebody else has also um, put something in the chat about the library of things, um, which is a scheme I've only become aware of, but people might know more, um, which operates in Lambeth. I think it's still operating in Lambeth. And it's basically like you were saying earlier about equipment 
that people might buy and only use once in you know in sort of their lifetime and I think um, DIY equipment apparently <laughs> is comes under that heading that somebody will only use something once in 70 years um, so it surrounds um, DIY mostly but I think the idea of it is is something worth exploring and whether we can in this borough look to to do that really and where that might be test it trial it um yeah that's really um it, it just seems to be um off a real potential in line with the sort of things that you were talking about in your presentation yeah so uh library of things is actually something we have talked about um, um we haven't um we haven't got plans to do something right now uh, around it but it is something that we know about and it's something that we have thought about and something we're quite keen to, to do as part of our work around climate change and as part of our work around circular economy so we know that there's there's a few examples where it's been taking off in, around london and so what we're going to do is, is try to speak to those people about how they've set it up because um, when we have thought about it we're like well, how, do, how do we do this and what do we need to do um so we are going to be looking at that and, and thinking about how we can set that up um, and it is, is something we are thinking about. Fantastic, thank you um, very much for that. Um, so we've got um, another one around, uh, Mon again, you were saying about car club membership, and that's really interesting to know that it, it takes 18.5 vehicles off the road. Um, also the, the point you said about uh, offering newer and more electric options is, is great as well, because that, um, that that's really helpful because Newer vehicles will be um, will give out less emissions, and then also there there'll be more electric op options as well. Um, so uh, there's a question from Ben Ben Kosa. I wonder if you want to, to ask you to unmute. If you want to come off unmute, there was a comment you had around uh, for RFS for Richmond Fringe Scheme. Ben, don't know if you're still there. I'm here. Hello, can you Hi. hear me? Yes, can you hear you now. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a question so much as a statement. I uh, just I wondered if uh, RFS were aware of uh, the um, ca e -ca uh, cargo bike scheme uh, coming out in about a year's time. Uh, it could be useful to them and perhaps their clients to shift uh, single uh, mm, you know, items of medium size to small furniture and crockery, et cetera, what the gentleman was talking about. Uh, I, well, I, I wasn't aware, thank you for the, uh, raising that. So uh, certainly um, an interesting idea. Uh, one thing that we are exploring um, is a move from diesel to electric. So one thing we do want to do is to, um, uh, we know we're conscious that we're trundling around, around in a Luton van, which you may have seen a picture of in my um, slide presentation, um, and actually um, thinking about moving to electric or more, at least at certainly more sustainable forms of transport. But um, uh, you know, shifting things around certainly with furniture is 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 always a uh, logistical um, issue for many. So um, that's why the van collection service has proven to be very very popular. Um, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, it is it is free of charge. Fantastic. Uh, I, th I think you might be able to look up the details uh, on the council website, or if I knew your email, I could I could pass them over to you. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll share my uh, email address or the sort of general admin email address on the on the chat so everybody can can see it. Thanks. OK, thanks. Great. Thank you for that, Ben. Um, there was also um, this question from Chris Manning. Chris, uh, you, you had a question around uh, uh, prices of food and cleaners and soaps. So I'm going to come off mute. Yes, I was just. Um... We, we use that that shop and it's absolutely wonderful uh, for, 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 for buying all the different foods and oats and all these other things. But I'm just wondering, um, I mean, the demographic, obviously, of most of Teddington is, is a pretty sort of good one socially. I'm just wondering what there might be um, in terms of encouraging people with less incomes or who aren't so well off um, being able to buy, um, you know, affordable, affordable nutrition. 
and sort of kind of also kind of looking at shops like Holland and Barrett and thinking, well, how does one cut out the sort of the middle bits that make the product more expensive um, and have a sort of system which of, of shops which, it, you know, like Holland and Barrett, but it would be it would be like the, the, the ethical solution in, in the high street. Um, I mean, I think you know, we only stock more than ninety percent of our stuff is organic, which is what makes it more price. It makes it less access, accessible for food, um, and that's why I do hope that supermarkets are able to introduce refill, you know, and and that it does expand in that way, so that there is more affordable pasta and oats, right. and general stuff, um, which. If I had a shop twice the size, I would do. <laughs> <laughs> we love your shop. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I have customers that come in and they just do certain, you know, they do the washing up liquid, which is a similar price, but they, you know, organic pecans, for example, are very expensive. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, unfortunately for me, I can't do it, but I, I do think, supermarkets are looking into it and they're looking at ways to make it more accessible. Great, thanks Kate. Um, there's a question from, or a, a comment from Grant, Grant Lewison. Grant, if you could, uh, I'm just gonna find you there, ask you to unmute. Grant. I don't know whether you can hear me. Um, yeah, I can just wait here. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's about leaving items which you don't want on the pavement outside your house. Uh, in Germany, I think they have a regular collection once a month on a particular day. And many people do this and go around looking for things. And it's apparently very popular. And there's another question, actually, somebody saying it was done in New York. But I believe yeah. it's technically illegal, actually, to leave stuff on the pavement because it's an, uh, it, it's a, it causes an impediment to people. But if it was done once a month on a regular basis, I think many people would go out and look for things. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I wouldn't encourage Richmond residents to leave stuff uh, lying around on, on the streets. I think I would be, uh, not be being a very good local government officer if I was doing that. No, but, they're, they're um, coming to do it once a, to do it one day a month. And it, and it would be regularly done. And of course, if you have to remove stuff the next day, if uh, it wasn't collected. Yeah, um, but certainly that, that's something that could be uh, looked into. So um, when I've, I've been looking into the circular economy, then, then one of the things that, that came up was um, uh, an approach in uh, Austin, Texas, in America. Um, so they had um, specific sites where, um, where um, building companies could leave materials that they didn't need. Um, and so if they were, say, building a house, they had leftover wood, they could leave that there instead of disposing of it. And then somebody else could come along and pick those things up and then they could mm -hmm. use, reuse those and recycle those. So that's, that's an approach that uh, another city has taken around it and apparently saved an awful lot of um, awful lot of materials and saved the carbon emissions associated with it. And it's also uh, fostered a, a much sort of healthier and, and better building industry within the city as well as companies kind of actually start talking to each other a bit more about well I've got this spare material do you want to take it so instead of kind of leaving it in this site that's dedicated then actually they arrange to exchange it with themselves so it's kind of um, fostered that kind of collaboration between different companies which is is a part of um, it's a part of the the circular economy is, is that collaboration and working together and things like that um, so I'm conscious that we've overrun the half seven um, uh, uh, sort of target that we had to end. So I think there's, there's um, I'll try and pick out um, one more um, comment or question in the chat. Um, let's have a quick look. Uh, there was, um, sorry, uh, there was another question from Mon. Mon, if, if you wanted to come off mute and, um, and, and ask because you're saying about empty premises and, and things like that. Oh, just I'll just uh, yeah. If you come off on mute now, you should be able to. Right. So I also apologise for being so active on the chat. No, it's no problem at all. No, I think one of the things that you know, quite a few people that I'm connected to and involved with, including the Sheddington project, which Chris Manning earlier is 
that was um, instrumental in setting up is looking at um, you know the use of retail empty retail units for you know repair schemes and, and so on or having satellite repair type schemes or making making stuff repairing stuff um, but it's the cost of it's finding premises and the cost of those premises um, is is quite a barrier so I just wonder how do we how do we overcome that that aspect um, so Simon yeah, uh, Kate. Uh, I don't uh, know if you uh, Andrew, I, I, yeah, I, I can offer a, a, a bit of uh, insight on that. So um, it's always difficult because um, landlords need to make some make some cash. And actually, there is one way which doesn't benefit the council that much, but um, one way that charities can um, uh, take uh, the benefit of some retail premises, which is on um, on a pop up basis because charities get um, business rates relief um, for occupying the, uh, the premises. So um, typically the way that would work is that uh, it's a short term uh, lease, so it might be 28 days. Um, but it does mean that um, there's limited risk in terms of the long term uh, occup occupancy for the for the site. Um, it's usually free of charge. There might be some uh, charge for the utilities. Uh, but that is one way of charities to be being able to um, uh, take up a, a residence in a in a site. And we at the furniture scheme have used that in a couple of places, um, not actually in Richmond, but uh, just outside the borough to store some of our furniture. Uh, and we're also able to to work with a couple of other charities to help them out with um, with space. But certainly, if there was something that um, a model that could help. Uh, landlords um, uh, offer up some some retail um, space for that then you know uh, we, we'd all be jumping up and down and uh, trying to take advantage of it um, and it will be interesting to see how the high street uh, recovers mm -hmm. after all of this because there's been a, a big hit on a number of retailers and you've got some enormous sites that um, such as Debenhams and things like that and shopping centers which are half empty so um, uh, use use of space would be great for lots of really good reasons that's brilliant thank you simon kate i'm just wondering if you want to share anything about your experience in, in trying to find um, a space to do this yeah i was quite naive <laughs> when i started about how the high street worked and thought it'd be quite easy just to set up a pop-up and you know and the estate agents sort of laughed me out of the shop um uh, out of their offices but um i did find you know by april by subletting from somebody else a bit of space that worked quite well for me and it was more affordable um, and I was only able to rent this place and to get a lease on this place after two years of trading to show that I was a viable business um, otherwise it, it's very difficult to get a lease <laughs> and and they are expensive and it and you have to commit a great deal to it um, so it would be great if these em big empty spaces were more accessible on a temporary basis for people. Um, there's about three empty banks within about 100 metres of this shop now. And they're huge. I mean, the one across the road, it's great that it's become a studio, but there's HSBC and I can't remember what the one on the corner was. It's been closed so long. And then Barclays is closed and they're all going to sit there. You know, one of them sat there for two years, if not longer. Um, and yeah, if, even if they just somehow were able to to get access to them on temporary basis until they are leased, it, it would it would be great to see you know charities and and, and as Mon says, you know these sorts of workshops and things popping up because the high street otherwise is going to be you know half empty or and it half it, you know it already is in many places. Yeah, and it's a really interesting approach that kind of use of. Uh, it's called meanwhile space, I think. Um, mm. So it, it's about having those uh, uses of buildings that, that fill in as sort of a longer term tenant can be found. So mm. uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting. I tried, you know, I tried originally, and they were like, no. <laughs> um, so it's. I don't think it's very. Sim I don't think at the moment it's very accessible or easy to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all, because I'm, I'm going to have to bring this to a close because we, we've overrun by 10 minutes and consciously I don't want to take up your time, though I, I do feel that we could probably talk about this for, for most of the evening. Um, but um, I just want to say thank you very much for taking part in today's session. 
Uh, we hope you all now know more about the circular economy and are as enthused as myself and our panelists about its potential to help tackle the climate emergency and create a green economy as well. Um, so I'd really like to thank Simon and Kate for sharing their work and giving up their time to, to talk to everyone here today. Um, it's been really amazing and showing us how the circular economy is already working in Richmond. It, it is there. It's not as big as maybe it could be or should be, but it, the circular economy is there and it does exist and, and we should try to support it where we can. Um, so we're going to be um, sending around a follow-up email to everyone who signed up to the event. Uh, we'll include some links and key information um, so you can follow stuff up if you want to. Um, and then we're also going to include a very quick survey that I'd ask you to fill in uh, just about what you thought about the event, how you found out about it, and then anything you're going to do as a result of, of coming along to this. And then you'll also be able to record, uh, view a recording of the session um, online very soon. We'll, we'll send a link around to that when it goes up as well. Um, and it'll be up on the, the Richmond website, um, so you should be able to, to find that fairly easily. So thank you all again for attending. Thank you, Kate and Simon, really appreciate your time. And um, yes, I hope that you all have um, a, a wonderful evening and that you uh, to support your local circular economy where you can. Thank you very much, everyone.